Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to this lecture video for module three, which uh, will discuss uh, negligence, especially that aspect about standard of care and breach of duty of care. In the first module, I had provided an overview of torts, and we essentially said that uh, torts would often involve an act or mission that leads to harm or injury uh, as a result of an act or remission that infringes on a legally recognized right. And therefore, it is crucial that in an action for tort, there has to be proof of the, the act or remission leading to harm, but it has to be based on harm uh, of uh, a legally recognized right. In module two, we talked about we started talking about negligence as uh, one of the uh, most commonly litigated actions in tort because uh, you know it, it's quite often that uh, people engage in negligent action that that leads to harm and we will note in module two i had stated that there you know uh, the, the law recognizes that people can be negligent and I mean, a lot of us are negligent almost on a daily basis. And because of our negligence, forgetfulness, uh, failure to take precautions, we can potentially cause harm to a lot of people. But the common law recognizes that to found an action uh, on the tort of negligence, it is insufficient to prove that there was negligent action that then led to, to harm. Because if that were so, that was the, 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 the common law in the, in the 1800s. If that were so, it would be very easy to file an action, uh, a negligence action, on the basis of uh, the failure of somebody uh, to take precautions or to prove that you know, somebody had been negligent, which led to harm. One of the crucial points, one of the crucial elements, therefore, that the common law now uh, is, uh, requires is that there has to be proof of a duty of care. In the absence of a duty of care, even if an action that is negligent leads to harm or injury to another individual, it, there cannot be a successful action uh, for, for tortious negligence or for an, an action on tort on the basis of negligence. There has to be a duty of care. And in module two, we canvass those instances when there are recognized uh, classes where there is an expected duty of care that can uh, be in relation to uh, family relations, or that can involve the case of you know, employer and employee. It can involve uh, a relationship between a professional, such as a financial advisor dealing with a client or a lawyer dealing with a client, or in the case of the medical profession, a medical professional uh, treating or uh, providing diagnosis to a patient. And in those instances, the law recognizes that in these particular established uh, cases where there is uh, an established relationship, there arises a duty of care. However, again, it is one thing to establish that there is a duty of care. As I pointed out in module two, one of the critical questions that we need to ask is what exactly is the, it's the content of that duty of care? In other words, what is the expected standard of care? Again, it is insufficient to prove that there is a duty of care, for example, uh, in, in the relationship between a lawyer and his client or a medical professional and his patient. Does it mean bec that because there is a duty of care necessarily, every single action, every single potentially uh, negligent action of a professional caught in that relationship would then have to be uh, responsible for any uh, damage simply because there is a duty of care. And the courts have pointed out that that is not sufficient. What must also be established in order to prove that there is a breach of a duty of care is that there is a breach of the standard of care that the circumstances uh, would require. So in this particular module, our goal would be to talk about the content of the duty of care in terms of the standard of care that the law would expect and then uh, to talk about the principles that govern those instances when there is an attempt to determine whether or not there is a breach of the duty of care. 
So that is uh, the, 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 the uh, focus of our discussion in this particular lecture vi video. Uh, what I will do is to uh, divide this lecture into two parts, although it's just one particular vi video, but part one will talk about the standard of care. And as we will notice, the standard of care uh, is on the basis of what a reasonable person would do, which leads us to the question, who exactly is the reasonable person? And as I will highlight, uh, the common law is, pretty, is very clear that the standard of care that is expected is actually one that is objective, as opposed to being subjective, which would look at the idiosyncrasies and the unique characteristics of a defendant or a plaintiff. But instead of uh, applying a subjective standard, as far as the standard of care is concerned, what is used is an objective standard of the reasonable person, not the particular plaintiff or defendant in a particular circumstance. So that will be uh, the first part of this lecture video. And then in the second part, uh, we'll we will discuss uh, principles that govern uh, a breach of duty of care. And uh, as we will see, when it comes to allegations of a breach of duty of care, the, one of the basic questions we ask is that, what exactly is, uh, what, what can we expect as a reasonable response of a reasonable person to a foreseeable and not insignificant risk? Again, almost any action that can be considered to be negligent, uh, you know, can potentially lead to risk. And so, for example, if I were to play cricket, although I don't play cricket, but so let's say I play golf, I play golf a lot and I hit the ball. Uh, if you notice some of these uh, golf balls, they could travel everywhere or anywhere. Does it mean that every single instance of me hitting the ball, you know, injuring somebody, that would then lead to me uh, being responsible for, for the harm or the injury to a potential plaintiff? The basic question there that we will have to examine is the uh, question of foreseeability of the risk. And that risk, must not be insignificant as the common law will, will, will tell us. And so uh, in this particular uh, module, at the end of the module, you should be able to understand and explain how the general standard of care and common law operates, understand the degree to which it is objective as opposed to subjective. So as far as the general standard of care is concerned, it is meant to be an objective standard of care. Explain the general requirements of the Civil Liability Act 2003 Queensland in relation to standard of care and breach of duty. And as I highlighted in the previous uh, lecture videos, our focus would be uh, on the Civil Liability Act of 2003 Queensland and not the uh, Civil Liability Act of other jurisdictions or the Civil Wrongs Act of another state because it's not possible to canvas and examine every single statutory intervention uh, in relation to uh, the law on torts in Australia. So as I, as I mentioned, as a result of the IP report of uh, 2003, there have been uh, attempts to reform the law of torts by the state parliaments. And um, although there was, a, there was an effort to try to unify and arrive at a uniform set of laws, statutory laws pertaining to uh, reforms to uh, the, the law and torts. It hasn't always been uniform in, in all the states. And we will not be able in this unit, obviously, to uh, examine each of those. So we will focus instead on the Civil Liability Act 2003 Queensland. And at the end of this module, you should also be able to explain the specific characteristics of the Civil Liability Act 2003 in relation to the standard of care and breach of duty by particular classes of defendant and in particular classes of risky behavior and apply the common law and legislative principles to specific fact scenarios to determine the standard of care and breach of questions. So again, uh, you will notice that when we examine uh, issues, for example, of breach of care, or examine issues of the standard of care, these two concepts are always interrelated. You, it's difficult to examine uh, 
allegations of a breach of standard of care without obviously knowing what the expected standard of care is. And nor can you speak of the, of the concept of standard of care in the abstract and because you need to examine the particular circumstances in which a particular breach of the standard is meant to have occurred. So these two concepts are interrelated. So, uh, as I mentioned uh, in the previous week, we talked about the duty of care. Does the defendant owe a duty of care to the plaintiff? That was the question we examined in module two. This week, and in this particular module, our focus is on the standard of care and breach of the standard of care. And uh, the questions that we ask would be, has there been a breach of the duty of care by the defendant? What exactly is the standard of care that is expected under the circumstances? And has there been a breach of the standard on the facts? So it is crucial that we examine uh, the factual scenario or the circumstances of the alleged breach or the, uh, the tortuous action, because although there are certain principles that govern, in fact, as I noted in, in module two, you might have the same set of circumstances, but in, in the sense that there is, a, there is the same set of potential negligent action or omission, but depending on the particular cir circumstances of the case, there might not be uh, a successful action uh, based on the tort of negligence. Next week, uh, in the next module, our focus will be on damage and causation. Yes, and causation. And um, our focus actually will be on causation, yes. And in that particular case, um, as I noted in um, the, 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 the first video, which provided an overview of, of this unit of the law of torts, I had pointed out that again, although it is crucial for us in, in, a, in an action for tort, it is important to establish that there was an action or tort that led to an injury or harm uh, to, a, to a plaintiff. And uh, that harm uh, was, that th there was harm to a legally recognized right. It is insufficient to just say that, you know, there was negligent action which led to harm. There has to be proof of causation that it was in fact, this particular uh, uh, action that led to the harm or injury of a particular plaintiff. Uh, some of the formulation would be that, you know, but for the conduct or the actions or emissions of this particular defendant, the harm wouldn't have occurred to, to the defendant. And so we're going to be examining that, we're going to be examining that, the notion of causation and damage uh, next week. Okay, now, what I'd like to remind you as we listen to this particular module and as we go through this particular unit, uh, as I highlighted earlier, you need to pay attention to the factual scenarios of case law. It will not be sufficient again to just say that, you know, in this particular, in this particular case, the court decided this way. Because a decision of the court will often revolve around the particular circumstances of the case. We do know about the, you know, um, the idea uh, in, in, uh, in, in the common law of uh, the requirement of legal precedent so that uh, lower courts uh, especially uh, would seek to arrive at a judgment that is based on precedent, usually from a higher court, so that there is a uniformity of court rulings. But in, in even when we think about the idea of, of legal precedents, what we need to recognize is that you can't just cite a case law and say that on the basis of this particular case, then this is the judgment. In the case of torts, and we will notice that there are a lot of cases involved in tort law, I'm just noticing the rain there, which can affect the signal here. Uh, give me a second, I need to close the window. Give me a second. Uh, 
Okay, sorry about that. That was the first time I interrupted a, uh, a recording of a lecture video, but it was raining and I felt that, you know, it may uh, interfere with the recording. So as I was saying, um, you'll notice that in Tor Claw, there are a lot of uh, cases you would be going through. In fact, in this particular module, uh, this particular chapter, chapter three, is a, uh, has 110 pages devoted to it by the, by the, by the authors. And so you need to pay attention to the fact that uh, a lot of the judgments of the court will actually be very uh, case scenario dependent, depends on the factual scenarios. And based on the scenario, that will lead to a different ruling. So pay attention to that. Okay, now moving on. Let's begin by talking about uh, the breach and standard of care. And as we will know, uh, when we speak of the standard of care, what is expected is reasonable care. So the care that is expected is one that you can argue to be reasonable because there might be uh, standards of care that would be considered unreasonable, meaning you would expect too much of a, of a particular, particular defendant, but that is not what the law would require. What is required is reasonable care from the viewpoint of a reasonable person. You cannot expect every single individual to, to act in a way uh, to ensure that there is no harm or injury to another on the basis of care that wouldn't be considered unreasonable in order to just avoid and foreclose all sorts of injuries. If that were to be the case, you know, then um, we might as well not be moving around because every single you know, action that we take can potentially cause injury. Uh, even in the case of employers, you know, there's always the danger that there is harm that befalls in an employment situation. But if we were to be too afraid of injury, uh, then you know, society, society cannot function. So what is expected is reasonable care from the viewpoint of an objective, reasonable person. Uh, as set out in uh, Section 9 of the Civil Liability Act 2003 of Queensland, uh, what the, the basic question that is asked is what would a reasonable person do in response to a reasonably foreseeable risk of injury? So we talk of, a, of reasonable care in relation to a reasonable person, but it also has to be in, re, in relation to a reasonably, reasonably foreseeable risk of injury. Uh, we, we will be discussing the, the notion of reasonably foreseeable risk of injury uh, towards the end of this particular uh, le lecture video. And as I mentioned, uh, as far as the standard of care is concerned, it is the standard of a hypothetical reasonable person, uh, one who is of ordinary prudence and skill. So um, it's not going to be the standard of James Bond for those who are familiar with James Bond, you know, uh, somebody who is extremely skilled uh, or, you know, somebody it's not going to be the, on the basis of a standard uh, of somebody who's an expert, for example, in health and safety, who knows that, you know, uh, about the dangers lurking uh, in, in a particular environment. The standard that we talk of, as far as the standard of care is concerned, is a standard of a reasonable person who is, uh, in, in the contemplation of law, is a person of, is an ordinary person of ordinary prudence and skill, as we see later on. Now, what we should remember is that when we talk about the standard of care, the standard of care, as we see in the cases, the question of the standard of care is actually a question of law. What this means is that because it is a question of law, ultimately it is for the courts to determine what exactly is the standard of care uh, expected in this situation. That is a crucial point because if there were to be litigation uh, on the basis of an action of tort, you probably will uh, if you were the barrister or the solicitor involved in a particular civil action, you would obviously introduce um, particular experts who would provide um, uh, testimony in relation to a particular standard of care, uh, in relation to a particular case or factual scenario. But we will notice that because it is a, because the standard of care is a question of law, ultimately the, the arbiter of what the expected standard of care is under the circumstances would have to be the judge. And we will also know, observe that uh, as far as the standard of care is, a uh, is concerned, again, it is an objective standard. 
the standard from the viewpoint of a reasonable person or from the viewpoint of an ordinary person of ordinary prudence and skill. And so that uh, the basic question is how should the defendant have behaved in, in the particular circumstances? But when we talk of the defendant, we don't look at the unique characteristics or idiosyncrasies of a defendant, but do so from the context of a reasonable, hypothetical, abstract, ordinary person of ordinary prudence and skill. Now, I mentioned as well that uh, it is one thing to talk about uh, standard of care. It is altogether a different question when we talk about a breach of duty of care. Because when it comes to the, the breach of the duty of care, assuming that you establish that there is a duty of care under the circumstances, assuming that you're able to establish what the expected standard of care might be objectively under the circumstances, ultimately, again, part of the question uh, for, a, for there to be a successful action on tort, or the tort of negligence, will have to be proof that there was a breach of the duty of care. Now, that is a question of fact, which means that uh, the courts or the jury will have to uh, closely examine the particular factual circumstances of the case so that the basic question is, has the defendant met the required standard of care in the particular circumstances of the case? So it is about the particular circumstances of the case, the actual factual scenario. It's a question of fact. So you have to zoom in to the particular circumstances of the case. And it, in doing so, the basic question is, has the defendant taken reasonable care? So, so that when we talk of careful, careful behavior, we talk about the reasonableness of what we consider or expect to be reasonable, be careful behavior. And it is not about, as I mentioned, it's not about eliminating risk altogether because that is impossible or it will be impracticable or uh, it simply will not be feasible. And you know, if you were to eliminate risk altogether, there won't be any chance for enjoyment or even for thrill. Uh, you know, you can talk about motorcycles being susceptible to injury, uh, you know, mot motorcycle riders susceptible to injury, people going uh, snorkeling, people going on uh, scuba diving, uh, people uh, riding on hot air balloon. These, in a sense, are risky behavior altogether. But if you, or, you know, you could, you could, you could say that uh, swimming is dangerous. Diving is dangerous. Uh, diving, you know, from a diving board and a swimming pool is dangerous. But if you were to eliminate risk altogether, including, you know, um, avoiding the risk to skateboarders in the skate parks, what would life be like? So, ultimately, the basic question is: What is reasonable behavior that can be expected? Reasonable behavior in terms of trying to reduce or minimize the risk of harm. So going back to uh, the question of uh, the reasonable person, the courts have said that uh, as far as the reasonable person is concerned, negligence is the omission to do something which a reasonable man guided upon those considerations which ordinarily regulate human affairs would do or do something or doing something which a prudent and reasonable man would not do. So again, always the standard of care is on the basis of the reasonable person. Um, in the case of Hall versus Brooklands Auto Racing Club, is the idea of the man on the Clapham omnibus. Now that was a uh, case decided in 1933. Uh, I don't exactly know what the Clapham omnibus is. I should I should have looked into that, but that's the man who's riding on the Clapham omnibus. Maybe now is the man riding on on a train uh, or you know on a plane. Were there planes in 1933? Or um, in, a, in a more recent case, in 1985, uh, Justice Dean said that uh, the reasonable person is the hypothetical person on a hypothetical Bondi tram. Is that Bondi or Bondi? Okay, apologies to those who live in Sydney. Okay. Um, or uh, it is a an imaginary person, ordinary prudence and foresight as reflected in section 91C of the Civil Liability Act of 2003 Queensland, so that the reasonable person does not have the prophetic vision of a clear voyant. So it's not gonna be James Bond, it's not gonna be 
uh, somebody in the minority to report who could look into the future. It is simply a reasonable person with uh, ordinary prudence and foresight. So that is, uh, when you talk of the standard of care, it's a standard of the reasonable person. It's not even the standard of the judge. It's the standard of the reasonable person. Now, when we therefore uh, talk about the standard of care, we will often notice that uh, there are differences in terms of the expectations about the standard of care, depending on the defendant's characteristics or skill. So that when you think about it, uh, you make a distinction as far as the provision of advice by a lawyer or by a financial advisor. So that uh, if you were to have a legal problem, for example, and you went to your friend to ask for advice, or it could even be legal advice, and that friend of yours somehow provides legal advice in a very informal scenario, and you acted on the basis of that legal advice from a friend who is not a lawyer, uh, you know that, the, that your friend is not skilled in, in law. And so therefore the law wouldn't expect a, a, it wouldn't be reasonable to expect a certain standard of care uh, in relation to that friend, but it will be altogether different in relation to a person skilled in law like a lawyer. So we're gonna be examining, you know, the, the defendant's characteristics. Again, as I mentioned, it changes on the basis of the defendant's characteristics. Let's examine the case, for example, of uh, Imbri versus uh, McNeely, which involved a case of a 16 year old was permitted to, to drive, even though the 16 year old was unlicensed. He was an unlicensed driver. He didn't even have a learner's permit, but the plaintiff was the parent of the friend of that 16 year old driver allowed, you know, that 16 year old to drive anyway. So in that particular case, uh, no, case you will notice that the 16 year old uh, lacked experience and lacked skill. But the question is, could that be used as a defense? Since you know he didn't have the skill, he didn't have the experience. Can the can the defendant uh, then say that uh, you know uh, I have a the, the expected standard of care is actually less because I don't have the skill or I don't have the experience? But uh, the court, using an objective standard, said that knowledge of an experience is held not to affect the standard of care owed to other passengers or. Road users observe a display of L plates, but also by the essential requirement that the standard of care be objective and personal. So what that means is that because we have an objective standard and thinking about the typical 16 year old who drives a vehicle, you would expect a, a 16 year old driver of a vehicle to have somebody, uh, to be somebody who has the requisite skill and experience somehow to drive a car. You can't be changing or varying the standard of care based on the sub subjective uh, characteristics of the actual defendant in the case. So that's what the, the, the court has been saying. So that if an activity in order to be performed safely requires a certain degree of skill, undertaking that activity without the requisite skill may itself be a form of negligence. One of the uh, questions that should be asked is that whether or not uh, the skill would also, the, the level of skill expected of an individual would also out, be altered depending on the skill that the, that the defendant holds himself out to have. Uh, in this, in, in the case, for example, of Phillips versus William Whiteley, the, the plaintiff uh, spear uh, became infected after piercing done by a jeweler, but the jeweler had been doing this for quite some time. The plaintiff made an argument that actually, if it was a surgeon or a medical professional who was doing this, then in all likelihood, this wouldn't have happened. You know, there wouldn't have been an infection. But the court ruled that the jeweler was not liable because he had taken all reasonable precautions a jeweler could take. And you cannot expect uh, the jeweler to conform to the standards of a surgeon because you you know, in, in that scenario, based on the factual setting, you can only examine the standard of care based on an objective standard of what a jeweler in, in that kind of factual scenario would actually be doing. You cannot use the standards of a surgeon who wouldn't be doing it, you know, in, in a mall. So 
uh, in that particular case, uh, the rule was for as long as the jeweler took all reasonable precautions a jeweler could take, then he wouldn't be held uh, a, to a higher level of uh, standard of care. Now, if the uh, plaintiff holds himself out as an expert, then in that case, he will uh, be held, uh, he'll be expected, the, the standard of care that will be expected would be one of, a, uh, of an expert uh, person, in which case it will be the expert standard of care that would be, uh, that would be expected. So that an unskilled um, defendant undertaking, uh, undertaking uh, a task that requires a uh, special skill, there can be potential negligence uh, in a scenario when that defendant uh, is expected actually to have uh, required special skills. Uh, that can be in the case of you know, uh, people uh, trying to re repair a faulty telephone line, which are uh, we should be very close to one where there's uh, where there are power lines, or it could be a uh, somebody trying to repair a house. In which case, you would expect a certain level of skill. And so, in this particular case, uh, the court in um, the case of Pabato Nakis versus Australian Telecommunications Commission, which involved a telephone linesman being injured after falling off a ladder while repairing a faulty line. The court held that a reasonably prudent occupier does not rely merely on his own judgment and skill uh, in a situation where technical experience, which he does not possess, is required. He should obtain and follow proper technical advice or employ a qualified person to perform repairs requiring expert skill. If he meddles himself, he cannot complain if the standards of care and foreseeability of injury which the law exacts of him are not those of the hypothetical person on a hypothetical Bondi tram or Clapham omnibus, but those of the ordinary skilled person exercising and professing to have that special skill. So in that, uh, you know, it, it becomes pretty clear, therefore, that uh, if there, there is a particular factual situation which requires a special skill, you would expect that a person who gets into that kind of situation or scenario would, would be one uh, with, uh, with uh, the, the skills, with the specialist skills of a person who, who can find himself in that situation. The other question we need to examine, apart from examining the, the defendant's uh, skills, would of course be professional. So again, as I, as I mentioned, have certain skills, but it's a different skill altogether. How then should a judge determine the issue of a standard of care involving a matter that requires specialist skills or knowledge, example, medical surgery? So it's one thing to talk about skills, so the skills of a jeweler, uh, or even the skill of a carpenter. It's altogether a, a, a different thing to talk about specialist skills or knowledge. Uh, even when you talk about medical professionals, for example, you can have general practitioners so they essentially engage in a general practice of medicine, but you will have specialists for cancer, specialists for kidneys or bones and so on. Um, and in that particular case, uh, if we examine the case of Papatonakis, what it means is that if you are a general practitioner, you shouldn't really be providing advice perhaps on allergies or on, on cancer. You, you have to give it, uh, you have to find it out to, to somebody who is, who is a specialist. But in doing so, when you have a specialist uh, dealing with a factual scenario, the question is, uh, what standard of care is examined? That is crucial because when you have various specialists or medical specialists, you will notice sometimes you will say, I, I need a second opinion, or I probably need a third opinion. What if the first specialist says, oh, I'm sorry, but you know, you're gonna, you'll probably, uh, you probably have only about a month to live or Maybe the medical, this medical specialist will say, oh, we need to operate and we need to do this. But you will often notice that even various specialists will have various views as to how, as to prognosis, as to treatment and so on. And in that particular case, how exactly do you gauge the standard of care? Well, there seems to be divergence of uh, opinion 
across different medical specialists. And uh, in that particular situation, we can talk about the case of Bolam versus Fryan uh, Hospital Management Committee, where the court said that a doctor is not negligent if he acts in accordance with the practice accepted at the time as proper by a responsible body of medical opinion, even though other doctors adopt a different practice. The, the legal significance of the case of Bolam is that if there is some expert, if there are some expert witnesses who say that you know the standard of care was correct or was the proper one that was generally accepted by the medical community, then the, the court will often arrive at a finding that there was no negligence because in that case the, ex, the expert witnesses would be considered to be the, uh, the, 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 the responsible body. The, the problem, however, uh, when you notice, Remember, is that when it comes to the standard of care, I had already uh, highlighted earlier that questions about the standard of care is actually a question of law. So that ultimately, uh, the, the courts, uh, as we will see, uh, will make a final determination. They will not be bound by what expert witnesses actually say. Now, in the case of Rogers versus Whitaker, That should actually be a one letter T. I'm used to double letter T because my PhD supervisor from Auckland, who's now a professor at the University of Oxford, had a double T in, in his last name of Whitaker. Okay, but, but in matters involving uh, provision advice or information to a patient, the, the high court said that in the field of non-disclosure of risk and the provision of advice and information, the Bolam principle has been discarded. So we will recall that as far as the Bolam case was concerned, it actually involved treatment. So when there is when there is a question of treatment, uh, again, you know, the courts will generally uh, give very high value to the statements of expert witnesses. But the court made a distinction in the case of Rogers versus Whitaker between treatment of an injury or a disease, as opposed to the provision of advice and information prior to treatment. So in this case, the court said, in the field of the non-disclosure of risk and the provision of advice and information, the Boland principle has been discarded. While evidence of acceptance, of accepted, of uh, generally accepted or uh, of accepted medical practice is a useful guide for the courts it is for the courts to adjudicate on what is the standard appropriate standard of care after giving way to the paramount consideration that a person is entitled to make his own decisions about his life. So again, I, I highlighted before standard of care is a question of law for the courts. The breach of the standard of care is a question of fact. Because when you talk about the standard of care as a, as a legal concept, it is a legal concept which, which uses legal standards. And because it's a legal standard, it's a, uh, it is a question of law that would be appropriate for the courts to examine. In Rogers versus Whitaker, the High Court also said that a duty, uh, that the doctor has a duty to warn a patient of a material risk inherent in the proposed treatment. A risk would be, would be material if in the, circums in the circ circumstances of a particular case, a reasonable person in the patient's position if warned of the risk would be likely to attach significance to it. So, when we examine the case of Rogers versus Whitaker, put yourself in the situation of either being a doctor or a patient, likely like a patient. And you come to a doctor and say, doctor, you know, I have this issue. Uh, what should I do? Uh, can I ask for an ultrasound? Um, should I have this operated on? What you would often happen then is that uh, the GP or even a medical professional uh, would, would be pretty cautious and take the more conservative route in the sense that they will try to provide you as much information as needed. Because if a doctor uh, to which a patient had gone to for advice or information, if a doctor fails to warn a patient of a material risk and that material risk then eventuated, then in that particular case, a negligent action could be taken against the doctor. 
So there is a, a, there is a duty on the part of a doctor to warn a patient of a material risk inherent in the proposed treatment. Uh, Section 22 of the Civil Liability Act of 2003, Queensland, now provides that a professional does not breach a duty arising from the, uh, this is in the context of a professional generally, and we will notice Section 5, uh, it doesn't really speak of a medical professional. Hang on. Okay, yep. So in Section 22, as a general principle in relation to professionals, not medical doctors, a professional does not breach a duty arising from the provision of a professional service if it is established that the professional acted in a way that at the time the service was provided was widely accepted by peer professional opinion by a significant number of respected practitioners in the field as competent professional practice. So this is consistent with the Bolan principles that I noted earlier. However, in section two, it provides that peer professional opinion cannot be relied on for the purposes of this section if the court considers that the opinion is irrational or contrary to a written law. So again, this is a reiteration of the point that ultimately when you talk about the standard of care, it is a question of law which uh, the courts consider, but to the extent that the Civil Liability Act of 2003 displaces or overrides or tries to reform the common law uh, of torture of negligent action, uh, if the court considers that the opinion of a you know, general community of professionals is irrational or contrary to a written law, then uh, the court is not required uh, to rely uh, on the opinions of uh, peer professionals. In section five, uh, in section, subsection five of that particular section, section 22, it provides that this section does not apply to liability arising in connection with the giving of or the failure to give a warning, advice, or other information in relation to the risk of harm to a person that is associated with the provision by a professional of a professional service. So again, especially in relation to the medical profession, uh, we will notice in the case of Roger versus Whitaker that there is a duty, the, the common law duty continues or prevails that uh, where there is a risk of material harm inherent in a particular procedure, then there is a duty on the part of the medical practitioner or professional to provide as much information uh, to a particular patient. Uh, in section 21, uh, relating to doctors, uh, it provides that in relation to the proactive and reactive duty of a doctor to one of risk, a doctor does not breach a duty owed to a patient to one of risk before the patient undergoes any medical treatment or at the time of being given medical advice that will involve a risk of personal injury to the patient unless the doctor at that time fails to give or arrange to be given to the patient the following information about the risk. One, information that a reasonable person in the patient's position would in the circumstances require to enable the person to make a reasonably informed decision about whether to undergo, undergo the treatment or follow the advice or information that the doctor knows ought, or ought reasonably to know the patient wants to be given before making the decision about whether to undergo the treatment or follow the advice. So the, uh, the standard of care we expect of doctors uh, is also encapsulated therefore in section 21 of the Civil Liability Act of 2003, so that there is both a proactive and a reactive duty of a doctor to warn of risk. Uh, again, if you, we, we won't have the chance to examine all of the cases here, but to what extent, so what, what, one of the basic question is to what, to what extent is a doctor under a legal obligation, both under the common law and, and under the Civil Liability Act 2003 to actually provide, provide um, warning or risk of personal injury to the patient. Let's look at the COVID case scenario. We know that uh, given the COVID pandemic, a lot of people are dying, not so much in Australia, but you know, a lot of people have died. A lot of people not, not only have died, but uh, 
they've also, uh, you know, undergo, undergone debilitating uh, side effects as a result or effects of uh, the COVID-19 infection. And so therefore, uh, what we know today is that uh, there is an attempt at coming up with a COVID vaccine and trying to vaccinate the entire Australian community. Uh, and yet, just like any vaccine, just like any medication or just like any medicine, there's always the risk of side effect, right? Uh, okay, so there's always the risk of side effect. And it is because of the potential side effects, like, you know, uh, it doesn't really work. Because remember, even when you look at the COVID vaccine, the COVID vaccines we have today, uh, in many cases, it speaks of a 92% efficacy rate. So it doesn't really work for about 8% of the population. But more than that, it can lead to potential side effects, wherever that might be. Uh, it can lead to illnesses. Uh, it can lead to, uh, you know, COVID-19 virus, in fact, infecting the body, whatever. I don't, I don't really know. I'm not a medical practitioner. But the point that, the, the point that I'm trying to make is, would a doctor to whom a patient comes and says, doctor, should I have the COVID vaccine? What is the legal obligation of the doctor in that such scenario? Would the doctor be required to tell the, uh, the patient all the, the, the risks that being vaccinated by, by, COVID by the COVID-19 vaccine? Uh, would the doctor have an obligation to, to, to tell the patient about all the potential risks of being vaccinated? There is a danger there though, because if that were the case, can you imagine if the doctor paints all of these negative and bad scenarios about the side of, potential side effects of the COVID-19 vaccination? Uh, a lot of people may be dissuaded from uh, vaccinating themselves. So in that case, there, what the courts also recognize is that there is a, as we see in the, in, in, in the, in the cases, that there is a balancing act between being proactive and being reactive because if there is so much information about the risk, that may actually interfere with the autonomy of the patient. Because if a patient is bombarded by risks, the patient will probably say, no, I don't wanna have the vaccine or I don't wanna have this treatment. But that leads to the problem if as a result of the medical advice of a medical doctor, a patient then is dissuaded or prevented from actually undertaking treatment or have being vaccinated, wouldn't that lead to medical negligence on the part of the doctor? So section 21 uh, is important. Uh, section 21 of Civil Liability Act 2003 is important. So uh, examine that. Now, so we talked about the scale uh, as far as the objective standards are concerned, uh, standards of care, we talked about scale, we talked about special ordinary skills, we talked about specialist skills. The other question we have is, uh, what would be questions of age? So would the characteristics of a defendant matter in terms of the age? If we say that standards are meant to be objective and they are standards of an ordinary person with ordinary prudent uh, ordinary prudence and foresight, or the ordinary person on a clap ham bus or a Bondi train, so Bondi or Bondi, really apologies there, I, I'll keep using the word. If you have a defendant who is a 12 year old boy, the question then is, should you adjust the standard of care that is expected? Wouldn't that mean that you become subjective by looking at the idiosyncrasies and unique characteristics of the defendant if the defendant happens to be a 12 year old boy. So in the case of Mac Hale versus Watson, this involved a defendant who was a 12 year old boy playing around with a dart like piece of steel, threw it at the wooden post, but in doing so, uh, he hit a nine year old girl in the face. Now that's pretty common, right? You know, boys throwing around stuff, they, they may hit somebody. It could be on the playground in school or other scenarios. Now the court held, it is no defense to show that uh, a defendant is abnormally slow-witted, quick-tempered, absent-minded, or inexperienced as for adults, but it will be a defense to show that he was acting as normal for a stage of development. So in this case, the court, in the case of McHale versus Watson, the court did take into account the fact that the defendant was a 12 year old boy. So age uh, could be taken into account as part of the characteristic of a defendant. And for our purposes, the basic question is, did that then be turn, become a uh, 
an objective standard or was it a subjective standard because the court considered the age of the child of, of the boy when the boy was 12 years old but actually no that is an objective standard because what the simply the court simply did was to to use age uh, as one of the as one of the factors but you're looking at the age of all 12 year old boys it's not going to be the it's not the unique characteristics of that particular 12 year old boy defendant but what can you expect of a 12 year old boy in general under the same circumstances so it's still an objective standard as uh, justice uh, kilo said a limitation on the, upon the capacity for foresight or prudence, not as being uh, per person, personal to himself, but as being characteristic of humanity at his stage of development and in that same sense, normal. So it's not about the particular unique characteristics of the particular defendant still, it is one that, you know, when you examine somebody of that age, what would children of that age group do? Okay, so that's still objective. And the court was clear to point out that because the standard of care uh, in negligence action is always uh, based on that of a reasonable person, and that is an objective standard, it is no defense to show that a defendant is abnormally slow-witted, quick-tempered, absent-minded, or inexperienced. So you can't argue, it can't, uh, you know, if, if you were to be a defendant's lawyer, you can't argue that uh, a, the, the standard of care for my client should be less because he happens to be slow-witted, he happens to be quick-tempered, he happens to be absent-minded. That is no defense because the standard is an objective one. It is not a standard based on the particular unique subjective characteristics or idiosyncrasies of a particular of that particular defendant in that scenario, but one that what you would expect uh, of a reasonable person with ordinary foresight to do. Now let's examine uh, the direct defendant's characteristics uh, in relation to this ability. So would this ability of uh, the mental disability, for example, of a, of a defendant be taken into account in relation to the standard of care? An interesting case was the case of Ad Adamson versus Motor Vehicle Insurance Trust, where in this particular case, there was a defendant who was uh, initially hospitalized in a mental institution uh, but you know he, he wasn't really locked up and he was able to 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 leave the premises but in doing so uh, he ran out of the of the hospital uh, suddenly stepped in front of a bus uh, because he was thinking because he was in a schizophrenic state he was thinking that there were some people who were trying to kill him but in doing so he stepped in front of a bus that led to uh, trauma well, what is sometimes known as post-traumatic stress disorder, perhaps, uh, to the bus driver who was the plaintiff. Uh, the, the bus driver was so traumatized that you know uh, it led to mental harm to him. The question then is, would the standard of care uh, of the defendant uh, change as, as a result of the fact that he suffered a mental disability? And uh, the court said no. Uh, the defendant was held to be negligible, uh, was held, held to be negligent, uh, and that uh, the mental disability should be ignored as the reasonable person is never insane. Uh, okay, hang on. Um, I, I think I ended up, I ended up uh, confusing the two cases. So that was actually the case of, uh, of, of Carrier versus Bonham when, you know, uh, schizophrenic individual jump out uh, in front of a bus. So that, that was the case. Uh, and the court said that insanity is a misfortune. It is not a privilege. Their conduct should be access, should be judged according to society standards, including the duty of exercising reasonable foresight and care for the safety of others. So Adamson versus Motor Vehicle Insurance Trust involved a defendant who was schizophrenic and suffering delusions. He actually ran over the plaintiff. So in Carrier versus Bonham, it was other sch schizophrenic uh, jumping in front of a bus, of a running bus. Okay. Now, we talked about the characteristics of a defendant, the one who defends himself for alleged negligent action. The other question we need to ask is, would the plaintiff's characteristics be relevant as well? 
Now, the courts have ruled that if the defendant knew or, or ought reasonably to have known the plaintiff or the class of persons to which the plaintiff belongs was particularly susceptible to injury, then this susceptibility will influence the standard of care. So uh, in a situation, for example, where you have an employer uh, and the employer is aware that you know, uh, an employee only has one good eye, in a sense, there is a, in terms of the standard of care, uh, that is expected, there should be extra precautions uh, that the employer will, will do to ensure that the employee doesn't suffer an further injury to the good eye. Uh, it, it also means that uh, if a, an employer or a person or a defendant uh, is dealing with uh, young children, for example, certainly the uh, characteristics of the plaintiffs will be taken into account. That is a different standard of care. If a defendant, for example, is dealing with experts, it's a different standard of care. But if the, dealing, if, if the defendant, for example, is dealing with those who may have uh, you know, a more diminished mental capacity, then the plaintiff's characteristics, as we know, will have to um, be taken into account. Uh, in the case of Cotton versus Commissioner for Road Transport and Tramways, the, the court also said that you know, in a situation where a driver sees a pedestrian incapable of exercising normal standards, then special precaution should be taken. And that, that's a crucial point. Like, you know, when you're driving your vehicle, you make a distinction. When you see uh, a, somebody riding a bicycle on the road, you make a distinction between one who you know clearly is a cyclist who is experienced as opposed to a child who's probably 10 being on the road or, you know, a, a 12 year old teen, no, 12 is not teen, a 14, 14 year old teen. You're gonna have to you know, make adjustments uh, in, the, in that scenario. Uh, now, uh, in McHale versus Watson, uh, the court cautioned that any person under a disability is only required to take such reasonable care for his own safety as his capabilities permit. A one-legged man crossing a road is not expected in the face of danger to display the agility of a two-legged man. Again, uh, you know, if you were driving your vehicle, you see a pedestrian crossing the road, you make a distinction between uh, somebody who you know seems to be normal, uh, an able-bodied person, as opposed to somebody on crutches or as opposed to somebody on a wheelchair. Uh, you're gonna have to adjust, adjust your driving so that in that situation, you will notice that uh, you do take into account the plaintiff's characteristics because somebody who is on, a, on, on crutches, you can't just expect, expect him that, you know, the moment that the uh, pedestrian lights turn red to warn him that, you know, the, it's, it's going to be the green light for the cars uh, will, will be coming. You can't just expect that person on crutches to suddenly just take off and run, right? Okay. Well, this is a long lecture. Apologies for that. Now, so... Uh, we will also notice that the standard of care can also be dependent upon circumstances so that in an emergency, it may be reasonable to take risks that would not otherwise be reasonable. So uh, in the case of Watt versus Hertfordshire, um, the defendant's employee was injured by an unsecured jack, but there was no time to obtain a better vehicle before going to rescue a woman trapped under a heavy lorry. In that case, the defendant was not negligent. Uh, we now know as well that under Section 26 and 27 of the, of the Civil Liability Act, 2003 of Queensland, uh, em medical emergencies are now protected by, by the Civil Liabilities Act, as well as Good Samaritan legislation in other jurisdictions. So that uh, the courts know that if there is a medical emergency, then there is, uh, to a great extent, the standard of care will, will have to change. Because uh, even when you look at it from an objective standard, the ordinary person of ordinary prudence and foresight will react differently when there is an emergency, as opposed to it's just you know to, as opposed to a circumstance or situation which is just ordinary. Okay, so we've done part one. Uh, we talked about the standard of care. We're now going to go to uh, part two, where we talk about the breach of the standard of care and the principles that uh, are involved. One of the principles we will see is that when we try to determine uh, in a negligence action, to determine if there has been a breach of a standard of care in those situations where obviously there's a duty of care, 
One of the principles we consider is uh, the concept of foreseeable risk, okay? And the courts have said that for a defendant to be liable in negligence, the, the risk must be foreseeable. It must be that kind of carelessness that uh, kind of carelessness by a defendant, which must which might cause some kind of damage to the plaintiff. It requires the defendant to know of the risk or that a person in their position ought to have known of the risk. So the, the risk must be foreseeable to the defendant. So uh, if it is not foreseeable, then the defendant can't be held liable under the circumstances where there might be a duty of care. Uh, for example, um, if you were to have, well, of course, so you have a house and you, in an example, I gave a scenario where you, you have rat poison and because there are rats. You put the rat poison in a garage, uh, probably on top of, of the shelves. Somehow uh, you have a, a guest staying in your house. He became drunk and was looking for a lolly going around the garage in the middle of the night because probably he was, I don't know, he was intoxicated. He saw that, you know, in the, in the top shelf of the garage and then he started eating it and he dies or he has injuries. The question is, would the defendant be liable for the injuries? There's a duty of care because if you invited the person to the house. Um, but the basic question is, uh, you know, what's the standard of care and would there be a breach of the standard of care when you think about it, right? The basic question is, was it foreseeable on the part of the defendant that a guest would go to the garage to search for rat poison hidden in one of the shelves? That's gonna be the legal question there. Uh, and what we need to remember is that the, court, the high court caution in Rosenberg versus Percival that we must take special care to ensure that the risk is not foreseeable merely because of hindsight. You know, uh, they always say um, hindsight is always 2020. It's so easy to, to, to think back and say on hindsight, this shouldn't have happened, but that's not the way we operate. Uh, as far as the case of Roe versus Ministry of Health is concerned, uh, said reasonable foreseeability is assessed based on foresight, not hindsight. Of course, after the fact, it's, uh, you know, it's easy to say, I shouldn't have done this and so on. But that's not the way it works. It's about reasonable foreseeability. So in the scenario I gave, was it reasonably foreseeable on the basis of foresight that one can actually say, you know, this right poison, if I put it in the garage on the top shelf, is it reasonable foreseeable? Is it reasonably foreseeable to foresee that a guest while intoxicated, they go into my garage, look for that right po rat poison and eat it, right? So that's a question there. Uh, in Wayne Shire Council uh, versus Shirt, uh, the, the court uh, talked about the not far-fetched or fanciful test in this, in this, uh, in this factual scenario. There was uh, an inexperienced water skier who was injured while skiing in, in shallow water near the science which said deep water. So when you think about it, if you were on a river or in one of those areas where there's a body of water and it says deep water, uh, you would assume that, you know, it's deep. But more, more, more often than not, that sign was probably there because it warns people, you can't just be walking around thinking that it's shallow uh, because it might be deep and you might end up drowning. This was, a, this was uh, an altogether different thing because on the basis of the fact that deep water, uh, the, the water skier thought, you know, it was safe to be, to be skiing in, in that area. The court held that for a defendant to be liable in negligence, the risk of injury must be reasonably foreseeable. That is, it, it is a risk. The risk is not one that is far-fetched and fanciful. So if, if it can be contemplated that there is a risk of injury, that, you know, on the basis of that deep water sign, somebody may think, a skier, an inexperienced skier may think that, oh, it's, it says deep water, there, therefore it must be safe for me to be skiing because it's deep. If it can be foreseen that, you know, there, there might be such an inexperienced driver, uh, die, uh, skier being injured, then the defendant can be held liable because 
the risk of injury on the base because of that deep water sign is not far-fetched and fanciful. So the court said that a risk of injury, which is quite unlikely to occur, may nevertheless be plainly foreseeable. So just because it is unlikely to occur does not mean that it is plainly foreseeable. It uh, doesn't mean that it is not foreseeable. Such a risk is not one that is far-fetched or fanciful. It's fanciful. Fanciful. It doesn't follow that a risk which is unlikely to occur is not foreseeable. A risk of injury which is remote in the sense that it is un extremely unlikely to occur may nevertheless constitute a foreseeable risk. A risk which is not far-fetched or fanciful, fanciful is real and therefore foreseeable. foreseeable. Okay, now one of the uh, other principles involved when it comes to the breach of uh, standard of care talks about what is known as a calculus of negligence. When we talk about calculus, it's more, it's more like a mathematical formulation there. You take into account various factors. And so the court has pointed out that if a risk is foreseeable, the court doesn't just think about whether or not, you know, was that a fanciful or, or not far-fetched risk of harm? Was that a foreseeable risk? That's part of the equation using calculus or mathematics. But the court must also consider what the reasonable person's response to the risk would be. So you consider other factors. You, you talk about the probability. What is the probability of risk? You look at the gravity of risk, but you balance it again. You balance it against the practicability of precautions, which are necessary to, re, to, to reasonably safeguard against the foreseeable risk, and you examine the social utility of a defendant's conduct. What that means is that. Uh, as I mentioned before, um, you can't really try to prevent all sorts of harm. That's not possible, right? There was always risk. Every time you step out of your house, there's always the risk of harm. Uh, in fact, driving a car is probably one of the most risky behaviors every day, given the number of deaths on the road or injuries on the road, as opposed to just riding a plane. But we, we can't stay in the house, but even staying in the house can be risky. What if you know there is a, a plane that crashes and hits your house, or there could be a fire and so on? So risk is always there. The basic question that you ask is, although on the one hand, you look at the probability of risk and the gravity of the risk, so of course, the graver the risk, because somebody may die, uh, the greater is the standard of care that is expected. But on the other hand, you balance that against the practicability of precautions, because Trying to prevent harm can be pretty expensive and it may not even be feasible. You also have to balance it against the social utility of the defendant's conduct. Because yes, uh, the, the conduct of the defendant uh, might be considered risky. You can talk about you know, uh, skiing, scuba diving, hot air balloons and so on. It may even be testing of a vehicle. But are you simply going to prevent the defendant from you know, undertaking these activities because of the risky nature of the venture? You have to consider it from the viewpoint of the social utility as well. What is the social value of the conduct of the defendant? So that's part of the calculus of negligence. The, this calculus of negligence in a sense uh, is now found in section 9.2 of the Civil Liabilities Act. But we proceed first from the the Shirt formula, which was the case of Wying Shire Council versus Shirt, where uh, Justice Mason said that the magnitude of the risk and the degree of probability of its occurrence, along with the expense, difficulty, and inconvenience of taking alleviating action and any other conflicting responsibilities the defendant may have, are, would be part of the calculus of negligence. And this is now uh, encapsulated in, or codified in Section 92 of the Civil Liabilities Act where there are four factors in the calculus of negligence. One is probability, the probability of someone being injured by the defendant's activity. Two would be the severity, the severity of the injury suffered by the plaintiff. Certainly, if the severity of the possible injury is greater, then the, the standard of care is higher. The burden of practical alternatives, the availability and burden of practical, alter practical alternatives open to the defendant and the justifiability, the type of industry or activity that the defendant is involved in may carry inherent risks, dangers, or social utility. So you can't 
as far as statute is concerned, uh, the, 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 the Queensland State Parliament recognizes that you simply cannot uh, seek to prevent harm altogether. There's always that risk. And because there's always the risk of injury, you need to have a calculus of negligence, including balancing the burden of practical alternatives and justifiability. Uh, part of it, for example, would be like, you know, when you think about it, you have, you, you have um, elevators in, in most of the shopping centers. They, a lot of them can be pretty steep. Or it can be that when you look at, uh, when you examine some of the shopping centers, we, we have multi-levels. Uh, somebody can fall off a second floor, even if you've got railings, right? Now, if somebody falls off that railing, does it mean that uh, the defendant shopping center may be liable? Or what if somebody falls off uh, an elevator? So with, with that, you know, there is the probability of risk. It's reasonably foreseeable. It's pretty severe when somebody falls off. But the question is, would you, with the, with the courts or the state, Queensland State Parliament, hold the defendant shopping center to a higher level of standard and say that, you know, to avoid the risk of injury so that you don't become liable, put up high railings or glass so that it's impossible for anyone to fall off. But, you know, that one is, the, there's the burden of practical alternatives, but the second is justifiability. I mean, can you imagine a shopping center where you, you just block it off entirely, right? Okay. Now, uh, so, if you examine under section 92, uh, you talk about the probability of injury. It refers to the probability or foreseeability of the risk eventuating. In the case of Bolton versus Stone, the plaintiff was hit by a crooked ball and seriously injured. The ball had traveled 100 yards before hitting her, clearing the fence 17 feet, 17 feet high and 78 yards from the batman. The ball had hit out of the ground only six times in 28 years. So, in the case of Bolton versus Stone, the question was would the, uh, would the cricket ball venue be held liable given that there was a was always a risk of injury to, to to one of the spectators there but the court held that there was no liability because it wasn't although there was a probability or foreseeability of risk the risk of that particular thing eventuating was actually pretty minimal I mean how likely was it that uh, the ball would travel 100 yards clear the fence 17, 17 feet high uh, and 78 years on the batsman, when that only happened, uh, you know, six times in 28 years. You couldn't be expecting the venue to put up fences altogether so that everyone is safe. I mean, you, you can look at that in the, in the case of baseball. Uh, it can also happen in the case of um, rugby where after the scrum, somebody may kick, kick, kick the ball and into the stands. But what if in doing so, you know, a child, uh, there might be a baby as a spectator. But are you going to be putting up all those railings just to prevent the risk of injury? So part of it is part of the calculus based on section 92 is really to look at the probability or foreseeability of risk eventuating. Uh, in the case of roads and traffic authority of New South Wales versus Dederer, uh, this involved a 14-year-old boy who dived off a bridge striking a sandbar, but that was a stand, sandbar which often shifted according to the side. So in fact, uh, that particular uh, plaintiff, that boy, had seen other kids doing it. And, you know, we see it happen, I think, all the time, you know, where kids jump off the, uh, the jetty uh, because they think it's safe. But was there an obligation on the part of Roads and Traffic Authority of New South Wales to prevent this by putting up railings and fences to prevent kids from jumping off? There were signs already that said there was, should be no dry, there should be no diving. And the court said that there was no liability on the part of the defendant because although the magnitude, magnitude of the risk was self-evidently great, the probability of that injury occurring was however low because previously no one had been injured uh, you know, when they jumped off the, the bridge. Okay, uh, there's also the question of the severity of uh, the likely injury. So if, if the risk of uh, damage is greater than what is normal, then the obligations of the, of the defendant, potential defendant will be higher. So there will be a higher um, standard of care that would be expected in the case of Swinton versus the China Mutual Steam Navigation Company Limited because the wharf labor, laborers were involved in handling cargoes of mustard gas. And mustard gas is really deadly then obviously the defendant, 
had higher obligations given the unusually serious nature of the risks. And, uh, you know, the other cases there. Okay, so I don't have to go through them there on the slides. As I mentioned, part of the negligence calculus talks about the burden of uh, taking precautions. So, uh, and as I mentioned, it requires a cost-benefit analysis. In the case of uh, Romeo versus Conservative Converse Conservation Commission, the plaintiff while intoxicated was injured after she fell off a cliff at the popular viewing spot in a national park. Uh, the, the, the plaintiff sought compensation uh, from the Conservation Commission. She was saying, you know, they should have um, prevented the injury from happening by putting up railings or fences and so on. But when you think about it, can you imagine the number of national parks we have in Australia? And can you imagine requiring every single state to prevent injury by sealing them off? Not only in terms of the cost, but what would happen if you seal off these places and uh, people don't get the chance to see what nature may, may be like? Or even about preventing people from going to hiking in the national parks because of the risk of injury. In a sense, it's pretty absurd, right? So uh, my wife and I were just in Cairns um, about two weeks ago, and uh, we, we went to that canoe or something, uh, rail service and something. We saw the national parks, but you know, if you were not careful, you could fall off a cliff, but would the, uh, the defendant have an obligation to ensure that there is no risk of injury? And, the, and using cost-benefit analysis, it would be absurd to expect that. So the court, uh, the court, for example, had said in Romeo versus Conservation Commission that the magnitude of risk, the remote possibility that an accident would occur, the expense, difficulty, and inconvenience of, alle of alleviating conduct and the other proper priorities of the defendant confirmed the conclusion that breach of the defendant's duty of care to the plaintiff was not established in that particular case. Uh, I also mentioned uh, the justifiability and social utility of the, uh, of the conduct versus Hertfordshire County Council. There was a fire officer had been injured by lifting gear in the, in the back of a fire truck that was heading off to an injury. Should, uh, was the uh, county council uh, responsible for libel to uh, for the injury? And did it have an, a legal obligation to, to pre prevent the injury to the, to the fire officer who lifted a, a heavy gear? But the court said that in measuring due care, you must balance the risk against the measures necessary to eliminate the risk. You must balance the risk against the end to be achieved. If this accident had occurred in a commercial enterprise without an emergency, there could be no doubt that the, the servant would proceed. But the commercial end to make profit is very different from the human end to save life or limb. So in that scenario, given that it's an emergency situation involving a fire engine and a fire officer, uh, you would have to examine uh, standard of care in relation to the social utility and the costs. Uh, in E versus Australian Red Cross Society, the defendant had supplied HIV in infected blood, but uh, the high court, but the but the uh, court ruled that the emphasis should be placed on the effect certain precautions would have had on blood supply. If uh, if there was a requirement that the potential defendant had to be overly cautious about you know uh, supply of blood, we might run out of uh, blood supply, emergency blood supply. So in this case, the court said that to take into account the effect upon the blood supply is to say that a person in the position of the, of the, of the respondents was entitled to give priority to the interests of all blood users. And everyone in the community is a potential blood user over the interests of the relatively small number of individuals who might receive infect infected blood. To, say, to so say is to make the present applicant bear the burden of protecting the wider public interest. Uh, finally, we talk about obvious risks. And uh, as we know, this is also now in, um, in the Civil Liability Act. So that the rule is that there is no proactive duty to warn of obvious risks. Obviously, risks may be in relation to uh, you uh, seeing that you know there, there are towers 
I mean, there are power lines. That's an obvious risk. Uh, when you go scuba diving, when you go skydiving, these are obvious risks. And because they, they are obvious risks, uh, there is no, for example, the, 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 uh, the, the statute provides that there is no liability for personal injuries suffered from obvious risks of dangerous uh, recreational activities. A person is not liable in negligence for harm suffered by another person as a result of the materialization of an obvious risk of a dangerous recreational activity engaged in by the person suffering harm. Same thing we said, if you've got fences surrounding you know, power lines, that is an obvious risk. If a person decides to climb over the fence, knowing there are power lines and starts to climb up the power lines because you know, there might have been a, a, a kite that got caught in the power lines, that is an obvious risk. Uh, what is an obvious risk under the under the statute? It is a risk that in the circumstances would have been obvious to a reasonable person in the position of that person. Uh, Division three of the Civil Liability Act 2003 Queensland talks about the assumption of risk and we should examine this. It's a provision, the provisions are intended to reduce findings of liability, discourage potential claimants from instituting proceedings and encourage personal responsibility for the harm suffered. So you can examine section 13 to section 19. And so at the end of this module, you should be uh, able to understand and explain how the general standard of care at common law operates, understand the degree to which it is objective as opposed to objective, explain the general requirements of the Civil Liability Act 2003 Queensland in relation to standard of care and breach of duty, explain the specific requirements of the Civil Liability Act 2003, Queensland in relation to standard of care and breach of duty by particular classes of defendant and in particular classes of risky behavior and apply the common law and legislative principles to specific fact scenarios to determine the standard of care and breach of questions. And with that, I thank you for watching this video and I'll see you again. Bye.